<laughs> Good afternoon and hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Beth Ann Gerstein and I am the executive director of AMOCA. Um, and the mission of the museum is to champion the ceramic arts in all of its forms with exhibitions, studio programming, collections, and compelling public programs like the one that has brought us here today. Today's opening marks distinctive and impressive undertakings by two important artists, Cheryl Ann Thomas and Michael Rohde, and we're privileged to have both of them here with us today. Before I turn over the floor to curator Joe Loria uh, for today's talk, I must say thank you. First to our members and donors, whose constant support makes our ongoing exhibitions, events, and COVID-related pivoting possible. In particular, I would also like to recognize AMOCA's board of directors, many of whom are with us today. Their generous support makes it possible for us to host remarkable artists like Cheryl Ann and Michael. Connected Spaces is generously funded in part by grants from the Boardman Family Foundation and the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture. And what you see here would not be possible without my dedicated and talented colleagues, especially Pam, Oscar, and Israel for their support in building this beautiful installation, Paul Roach for creating a wonderful digital representation of this exhibition, and the rest of our amazing staff at AMOCA for everything they do every day to bring art to our community. And finally, my esteemed collaborator, Joe Loria, who curated Connected Spaces. Loria is one of Southern California's foremost curators of ceramic arts. When she was a curator of decorative arts at LACMA, she organized um, the seminal exhibition Color and Fire, Defining Moments in Studio Ceramics from 1950 to the year 2000. At AMOCA, Loria's past curatorial projects are almost too numerous to list. Um, but of note is um, Mind and Matter, which just closed in the Armstrong Gallery, and currently on view, Peter Callis, Enduring Legacies, and 50 Bowls, 50 States, and 50 Wood Fires. It's not a stretch to say that Joe has made invaluable contributions to the ceramic arts, and we are lucky to have her here with us today. Please join me in thanking all of these remarkable individuals and organizations and in welcoming Joe Loria. Since we are a triumvirate, I think we are a trifecta, however you want <laughs> to play it, um, I think we should be together because this show really is about all three of us. Uh, it was, for those of you who have read on the website or, on, or in the catalog, the, every s narrative has an origin story, which your husband would appreciate since yes. he's a librarian. <laughs> Um, our origin story is, is that I, I knew both of the artists separately, but since they are both friends and live relatively close together in Ventura County, uh, we got together and we also had lunch. And after seeing both of their individual works, I proposed an idea that they should do a collaboration but not in the formal sense of the word of, you know, work on one piece together. They're not going to collaborate that way. What they are going to do, what they decided to do, is they would collaborate by an exchange of visuals. And if Cheryl would do a piece, like you see here, Enigma, then Michael would do a weaving that responded to that particular porcelain vessel. And, and some of them are what we call triptychs because then there was another response. So some of them have two tapestries and some of them have two vessels depending on you know, how they want it to respond. And I'm going to let them talk about how they decided on their own methodology. Um, like a school teacher, I was not this time. <laughs> Mostly I'm didactic, but I said, you are the artist. You can decide on your own 
way that you want to do this collaboration, and they decided it would take a year, and thankfully, in a way, it was a year of isolation because of the pandemic in 2020, and as soon as they started, they would send digital images to each other, and that's how they would do their call and response. So, Michael and Cheryl, why don't you talk about how you met over lunch and decided how to proceed in, in this exchange? Well, actually, um, uh, it was interesting because Michael and I are both in, pretty independent when we think about our work, and um, we decided to just do our own thing, and we really didn't discuss what we were going to do with each other. A little bit, we did, but, but Michael already knew what he wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to do. So um, it involved a tremendous amount of trust because Joe had to trust us, we had to trust us, each other, and we had to trust Joe again for the installation and, uh, and our friend for the catalog and everything was just, everybody went beyond and above what I expected. So um, we both kept our independence and, um, and proceeded on our own to respond to the challenge. I think one of the things that surprised me about how the, how the um, collaboration evolved is that um, some of the, the work that Cheryl did first were, were works that she picked off my website that were already existing. And uh, I said, my goodness, how is she going to turn that into a ceramic sculpture? And she did remarkably well. And I said, oh, <clears throat> the expectation has moved up. <laughs> <laughs> And that would be the first piece that you encountered when you come into the gallery, which is Gold Cipher, right? That one was already... That's one, that's one that, <laughs> that she did that way. Yeah, and there, I think there's another one that's it's, uh, Blue, Cipher. Blue, Blue Cipher, Cipher that's also and, and works that way. But um, I'm a weaver who's always worked with blocks and lines. Um, sure, you can weave curves and things like that, but I didn't want to go that way. I wanted to take that as my, my marching orders, my limitation. What do I do? So um, Joe knew of work that I'd done before where I had taken a series of photographs of faces, usually people that were, you might recognize, and then turned them into a series of squares that were woven. Um, there's, I think there's one of them in the catalog that you might be able to see. And so for that, I would have 20 squares across and maybe 30 up and down. Um, but for these, I didn't want to try to get the image in the tapestry to be the same as the image in the piece. I wanted to get the color and the feel of it, the way that, that in space the colors relate to each other. And so I did the same thing, but, but with larger squares and uh, fewer colors. One of the things I think that Joe first observed is, is that uh, my colors, which had been quite saturated up to this point, became much more subtle and, and muted, as it were. And um, Cheryl, I think, has also talked about adding color in that she hadn't had used before. Well, also, the show uh, does have um, another dimension to it. I mean, not beyond three dimensions, but um, <laughs> the other dimension is that there is the, the exchange, the call and response, but each artist also has a certain number of pieces which do not correspond to the exchange because we felt that they should show uh, different perspectives of how they've been working, you know, as an, as individuals uniquely on their own without the you know the uh, collaboration. So, for instance, there are several pieces that Michael has done that are in his language series, and they are. I think a derogatory, didact, didaction. Anyway, yeah. you can redact it, right? Which mm -hmm. is a re was a response to I think the error of our previous president, um, or one be previous to that. Or, or politics in general. <laughs> in politics in general, <laughs> and then uh, these three pieces over here are home. They're they're tapestries that primarily have a motif, the two on the wall, of a house. And the other one is inspired by Buddhist uh, philosophy, and that is the shape of the Buddha. So those pieces were not part of the exchange. And Cheryl has made other pieces throughout the gallery where you see them singularly displayed. 
that are just part of your body of work. Um, and then there is a, a, a fourth or a fifth dimension is this room, uh, which does display work that Cheryl decided sometime during this collaboration that she was gonna change clay bodies. So for any of you who have ever done ceramics, you will know that that may sound like a small thing to do, but it is a tremendous uh, disruption of one's work if you change clay bodies, because generally you have to change everything else too. Um, so Cheryl decided she wanted to take her same approach to the, the ceramics uh, and make them, you know, as they are abstracted, but make them translucent. So the work in this room, which is more cloistered, um, is uh, because they are translucent pieces with a new clay body. Mm -hmm. And then Michael had to pivot, pivot. Um, I'm wearing this for my daughter because um, when she was a little girl, I always put her in twirly skirts and she just arrived, so um, I'm finished. But anyway, so Michael's uh, work here is a little different than the work out here. And primarily it's because the yarn is different. When Michael had done his large tapestries, they are mostly wool and alpaca, which are opaque uh, yarns. I mean, pretty opaque. You know, if anybody has a wool skirt, you know, it's uh, pretty opaque. Um, but this, he decided, is a better response to Cheryl because he, he said, I'll use silk yarn, which has more luminosity. And, mm -hmm. and Michael, how do you feel about this series as directly response, responding to Cheryl's pieces. I think, that, if it's not immodest of me to say, I think it worked well because Cheryl's first question to me was, uh, do you ever use translucent yarn? And granted, there are some plastic yarns that are translucent, but I didn't want to do that. Um, so I thought about the silk. And I'm working for photographs of, of, of Cheryl's uh, pieces. so. In the photographs, I will see a background and the piece itself. And so in, in these, when you look at them closely, you'll see that, that the colored parts are done with the silk yarn, but then the background parts are the wool to make a contrast between that, that reflective or, or luminous nature of silk relative to the, the flat nature of, of the wool. And Cheryl, how did you feel about when your pieces were finished after struggling with the, the, the new clay body and then building these translucent pieces? What was your determination? Well, the, the, the new clay body um, was horrible to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, especially the process that I do with these tiny coils. It, um, it's very brittle. It's, um, it dries very quickly, and so that, whereas my usual clay is kind of relaxing, this was like um, challenging. And um, so they ended up smaller than, than some of the other pieces, but um, I love the translucency. I'll keep working with it um, off and on, but I need a break in between because it's, um, especially uh, in a hot weather, I just can't. You work with that clay, but but on a nice damp day, you know, I'll keep working with it, keep trying things. Ruth Duckworth once told me that working with porcelain was a mean master, <laughs> and that it's cruel and unforgiving, but the rewards are insurpassable. So I think, too, I would say that about these translucent pieces because they do, as I say, add another element to the collapse. Mm -hmm. um, not only do they collapse, now they're more invisible. So what's the next, Cheryl? Is it gonna be totally deconstructed? <laughs> That's possible, just <laughs> the shards, just a table, table full of shards. <laughs> well, I, I think that the reason why I thought this exchange would work so well is because when I first saw Cheryl's work, which I had told the crowd earlier, the one that we shoved out so you could all sit down, um, was that I saw her work in Michael's house where he, you know, in his studio area, um, it was a, a smaller vessel. And I looked at it and I thought, this looks like fabric in a way. I mean, and, and then especially as you started to 
you know, have them uh, collapse more onto each other. It reminded me of Saturday laundry day, you know, where your, your, your kids just throw their, their clothes on the floor and there's all different colors and patterns, um, but in a much more elegant oh, way. <laughs> <laughs> but that does have um, a resonance with, with textiles because textiles are used to weave clothing and fabric. So, um, you know, and, and I think that your, your sense of abstraction, Michael, um, how do you feel about not, uh, you know, you said you wanted to abstract them more to make the squares um, uh, larger, but to me, they seem smaller than, than like those squares. So it's really the proportion of, of the square, you mean? Yeah, the proportion of, of the square to the overall um, tapestry. So even if we stood back or we took our cell phones, because I was saying before, um, I, I, it's hard to explain, but, uh, and let, let me just forgive myself by saying it's hard to explain, but uh, Michael had done these pieces we had in a show called The Empathy of Patience. And if you look at them from a distance, you can recognize that this is Frida Kahlo. But if you were in the gallery, there were, what, about 20 portraits of various heroes. They were all heroes until I said to Michael, we can't do a show that doesn't have heroines. So he added some women um, to the mix. But anyway, if you, if you were standing as close as I am here, you would mostly see squares. But if you got far enough away, it would make it into, you know, a, 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 a photo of somebody that you would recognize. And also the, the, the loop kind of got really uh, futuristic into technology when you also could take your cell phone and you could come up as close as this and take a photo with your cell phone and your cell phone would tell you what it looked like. So um, everybody in the exhibition was having fun running around and not texting, but, but taking photos to see who the portraits were, which is, you know, kind of fun. But I don't think that will work here, right? I mean, we would still have them abstract it. Yeah, it would still be an abstract shape. You just had to add another element of difficulty. Um, Why do the same thing over and over? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. So I really would like to ask at this point, this juncture, how do you feel about the collaboration? Do you think you're open to other exchanges or collaborations? I mean, do you think that this was fruitful for your growth? Or, you know, what, what's, your, what's your assessment of it? And, and you, can, you can be honest. Only if it's with you and Michael. <laughs> it, it would be hard to find a collaboration that went as well as this. I've done one, one other collaboration that was fine, but, but this one is above and beyond. I mean, Michael's in my work, um, even though it doesn't look alike, it has the same feeling, you know, and uh, uh, I feel comfortable working with him, but um, don't set up any collaborations with people I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. What I was going to say is it was such a, such a privilege for Beth and I to work with two artists who were mm, disciplined, organized, and very much on schedule. It's not always the case. And I think that because you are both that way, you probably worked well together um, because you, you would know that the other one, even in their isolation, was moving forward on, a, on the project. So, um, and as we say in the catalog, or somebody says it, I don't know who it is, that we had not seen these works together ever before they actually got installed. And, we did take a leap of faith. You know, we had maybe seen, we had seen all the individual work. It was photographed for the catalog, but we had never seen them actually on walls together. Nor have we. No, nor had they. <laughs> so we were really very, very charmed by, you know, looking at the pieces and realizing how well they associate together. And before I wrap this up, I just want to thank Frank Lloyd, who runs the Frank Lloyd Gallery, who was the person who introduced our community to Cheryl Ann Thomas's work, because uh, I believe you did at least two shows of Cheryl's work in Santa Monica. And um, it was there, too, that I got more exposed to your 
body of work. So yeah, actually, I think it was 13 years. <laughs> well, this is this was only two years. So you're you're on us for you know 11 more years of, of involvement. But um, is there anything else you want to say? Or, but they are here. It, they were going to be mingling in the gallery, so if you have specific questions to ask them, I'm sure uh, being as disciplined as they are, they will you know, have answers for you. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Michael and Cheryl Ann. And I want to thank all of you for coming. And if you enjoyed this program, we hope that you'll consider being a member of the museum. And you can do that at the front desk. And we hope that you'll join us for other programs and activities here throughout the year. Uh, and if you, not that we haven't pitched this enough already, but it is a beautiful catalog with some really interesting essays in it. And this is available at the gift shop. And if you'd like it signed, the two artists are here and the curator. So thank you for coming. It's been a pleasure.